just just start with the, start at the beginning. Then I um, well, as best as I can figure, I was conceived in Michigan, though, and I was born in Michigan. But my parents were early snowbirds. They purchased property in Coastal Manatee County in 1950, um, back and forth. And um, so I can truthfully say I've been coming to Florida since before I was born. <laughs> Though in that particular year of 1951, I was born in Michigan. And then thereafter, my life was divided uh, every year between Michigan and uh, Florida. I would start school in Michigan, the school year, and then finish the year here. Uh, likely the, uh, the reason for my interest in archaeology came in part from my father's profession, who was uh, he had a heavy construction company um, in Michigan. Uh, when he retired, he brought some of his equipment down to the property in Florida and proceeded to excavate and create uh, classic uh, canal finger fills with the notion of selling the property. Well, all that excavation, of course, turned up a lot of material, mostly paleontological, some archaeological materials, but mostly paleontology. Uh, that combined with the fact there was a, a gravel pit near our home in Michigan, which exposed a lot of fossils, uh, kind of got me started. Well, of course, the, my father's business, being an excavator, uh, had a big impact on my perspective, certainly. I like, I like to make the point that, you know, he was an excavator and I'm an excavator. You know, he used a bulldozer and I used a trowel. <laughs> you know, different approaches. I'm, I'm basically a prehistorian, mm -hmm. is my research interest in most of my work. But of course, I, as a contractor, I deal with whatever I find out there, and I do my, my best to find everything that's out there yeah. within the constraints of systematic sampling, of course. You know, mm -hmm. I, always, I like to point out to people, it's people ask, you know, how, how, do you, how do you find these sites? And I say, well, we, we put in shovel tests that are about this big and by regs are a meter deep, unless you have the water table, of course. And you, you, in a grid or a staggered grid, you put in these shovel tests regularly over a whole area. In terms of uh, recognizing the resource, well, a shell midden is... Oh, I dare say to most people, uh, pretty obvious in terms of its appearance, uh, generally coastal, uh, as far as the larger ones, its composition of shell, oysters, clams, conchs, but as well, um, shell mounds provide a unique uh, floral habitat type because of their elevation, drainage, and their alkalinity because of all the shell. So there's a recognized uh, ecotype association of plants that grow on shell mounds uh, that is a real signature botanically. And in fact, many of uh, the, the shell mounds throughout coastal Florida were really first recognized by early botanists uh, who explored uh, both coastally and in the interior of the state uh, from really from the 1700s on. Uh, and, of course, they were largely directed by the presence of very unique, um, sometimes, well, today particularly endangered species of plants growing on the shell mountains. So they're, they're, they're pretty obvious, uh, for the most part, uh, by their composition and the plants that, that grow on them. I've been working in continued process after we finish today. I'm back to my lab processing shell midden samples from the Perico Island site, which is up near the, the north, north end of Sarasota Bay, um, a large shell mound complex that dates back to at least 2000 BC, possibly earlier, uh, extending up to shy of, of history, shy of the 1500s. After picking through all this shell midden, and retrieving all the little bones and pieces of artifacts and so forth and doing other standard recordation of the, the material, there is no need to keep all the shell, the broken bits and pieces of food shell. And so I, I am in the process of, of creating a very fine shell driveway mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. in front of my house because I say, there's no need to keep it. 
I'm sure more work could be done with some some of it, but the archaeological site itself is still there, and it is uh, owned by, in this case, Manatee County. It's conservation land, so it's preserved, it's protected. So there, there are, are there's still plenty of shell midden for you know future archaeologists to examine if they have other questions uh, to be addressed. Mm-hmm. So too with you know a number of the sites here in Sarasota County. You know we've got some really really interesting sites recorded and preserved in Sarasota County. Uh, there's still a need uh, to find them. There are huge acreages in Florida that are publicly owned tracts of conservation lands, parks, etc. And now with the approval of Amendment 1, uh, hopefully this is going to work the way we want it to, that there will be a billion dollars a year for the next 20 years to purchase more conservation lands statewide. And I hope some of that money after purchase can be applied to doing uh, systematic archaeological examinations of, of these tracks or portions thereof to find the archaeological sites on them. I mean, there are some obvious things. Some of these mounds, of course, I mean, it's obvious, you know, mm-hmm. flat area, you got a mound. But there are, there are a lot of, you know, there's other sites that we don't know they're there until we do the, the control yeah. testing to find them, record them, GPS them in this day and age so they can be avoided. Mm-hmm. And, and, two, it depends on the governmental entity. I have, knock on wood, had really, I'd say, a great level of success with those people at the Southwest Florida Water Management District, Swift Mud, with whom I've worked over the years, in sensitizing them to these concerns. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the projects that I've done with Swift Mud have been restoration projects, creating new wetland systems to offset the losses to Tampa Bay, uh, in large part, is what I've been involved in. And in the best situation, archaeological survey work is done as early as possible before anything else is done Mm -hmm. to encourage uh, avoidance and preservation. And so when that has occurred, which has been my experience on these projects, uh, I I then thereafter see the the design for the proposed project, various lagoons and wetland systems and connections and so forth. and I was, oh, okay, well, we need to change this a little bit right here. We need to move this over a little bit because there's an archaeological site there. We want to preserve it. Mm-hmm. And I've had very good response in that regard uh, with those staff that I've worked with on the, on particular projects because there's no need for this particular feature to be exactly right here. Yeah. It can be moved a little bit. The, the cultural resources the term inclusive of both prehistoric sites and historic structures, uh, on public lands, I think we should be particularly careful with in terms of conserving them for the future, for future researchers to to examine very carefully. Uh, Archaeological sites are a non-renewable resource. Eagles can reproduce. Thousand-year-old archaeological sites can't. Once they're all gone, that's it. 